goes to him, right? It's not a pie, by the way. And it's not really bad, right? It's good. It's, it's basically, it has a lot of advantages. It basically usually has a single architecture, uh, if it has an architecture at all. Um, sometimes it doesn't, and I'll show you some examples where it didn't. Um, you use a single technology stack. So if you're familiar with this technology stack, you're fine, right? You can write Java until the end of your until the end of time. Um, probably some people will do that actually. Um, so it has a single code base that makes it easier to maintain. Well, it seems to be easy to maintain, except for dependencies, of course. But you know the technology, so that's easy to do. You have a single uh, deployment pipeline, stuff like that, and that's all good. But it also has some drawbacks, right? So everything is interconnected. There's loads of dependencies in there, and, and it's very hard to move on to newer technology. If you're doing, let's say, I'm going to pick on Java a bit because my client is a Java client, and I hate Java. Um, <laughs> I, not really. I just don't like it. It's, uh, it's not that bad, actually. So, so it makes it hard to change. Let's say you want to move on to, from a desktop application, move into web applications or mobile applications, and you have to move into new technology. And it's really, really tough, right? Um, and the reason, because it's tough, is because you have all these dependencies. Now, dependencies will kill you every time, right? You know that. This, by the way, is a, a picture of uh, one of my client's uh, uh, architectural landscape. These are all systems, by the way. They're all interconnected. Um, some of them are really small, like an Excel spreadsheet, and some of them are really big, like this one, which is SAP R3. It has a database that runs on 142,000 tables. <laughs> really, it does, actually. That's only this little part of this, of this landscape, right? So it becomes, the more and more dependence you have, the more complicated it gets. So I'm going to take you a bit down to history, because I'm an old guy. I've been writing code since I was 1983 or something, making money with it since 1987 or something. So I've seen lots of this stuff uh, uh, move around from bit to bit. So when I started writing code back in the 80s, it was quite simple, right? You wrote client server code. We didn't use VB, Power Builder. Um, uh, some C++, some C, stuff like that. Most of the code was on a database server, right? It was in your database, and some of the code was on an, in an executable that ran on your PC. That was when the world was really easy, right? <coughs> but also here, if you start, let's say, we, we duplicated a lot of code, right? And it became unmaintainable, it became some sort of spaghetti code, that's where the word spaghetti code comes from, by the way, at, at that point in time. And it got worse and worse. And then some smart people thought, oh, we have to do different architectures, right? So somebody came up with this architecture. It's the Corba architecture, right? Anybody of you remember this? Yeah, right? Didn't work, right? No. It was what? <laughs> Too complicated? We couldn't get it working. I worked for an insurance company back then as well. We couldn't get this thing on the road. It sort of tried to break down your existing system in bigger parts and then put something in the middle, which was called an org, an object request broker, and try to get this stuff communicating with each other. And the problem was the technology was not there yet. We couldn't get it working. So time went on, and we sort of started throwing this stuff away, and we moved on into the next era, which is the era of the service-oriented architecture. You've been here as well, right? Everybody wanted an enterprise service bus. I, I have been in an enterprise software development for years and years, right? So it's, it's, everybody was connecting to this enterprise service bus. Usually this enterprise service bus started to implement your business processes and then do all the orchestration and all the, well, whatever workflow stuff what is in there. And it sort of seemed a bit like the same. And also here, we figured out, well, some of our clients actually could get it working. So it was slightly better than the previous era, but still, it didn't feel right yet. And after being in this field for two decades, it sort of felt like Groundhog Day, right? You do the same stuff over and over again, every day, every day. Technology changes, and say, yeah, I've been here before, stuff like that. Uh, but we sort of moved on a bit, right? We started off with this spaghetti code, and we sort of started breaking down stuff into smaller pieces. Well, if you have these really big legacy systems, like my current client has a mainframe, I'll show you a picture of the mainframe later. Uh, and, and it runs 10 million lines of global code. Now, that is not something you can replace easily, right? That is pretty tough stuff. So you have to start breaking this stuff down. Now, this is a nice picture saying, oh, we started off with spaghetti code, and then we started breaking down uh, into larger components. And now this microservice stuff comes along. And we said, oh, these are all very, very small components. But they're still components. 
And there's a big difference in doing is that the, the, the big thing in the middle seems to have disappeared. Now that might be good at it, it might not be. I don't know yet, actually. So if you're asking me for, for the final conclusion about is microservices worthwhile, I don't know yet. It might be, but you might also end up with something which is really sticky and like mac and cheese and unedible and, and stuff like that. So you have to be really, really careful. So let me take you a bit down to what this stuff on microservices is about. It's fairly new, right? A lot of people say, oh, this is really brand new stuff. And, and then there's the old geezers saying, oh, yeah, we've been here before. It's Groundhog Day all over again. Um, and you, 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 if you look on the internet, there's lots of stuff you can find out there. Like, OK, decomposing applications for deployability and scalability. And then there's somebody else saying, what is a microservice? Nobody knows yet. What exactly is a microservice? How big is a microservice? I've seen Simon using words like macro-services. And there, there's, there's no definition of size of what it do, does. There's people saying, oh, they shouldn't be bigger than 100 lines of code. And there's other people like Sam Newman saying, like, oh, it should be something that you can rebuild in two weeks. But those seem to be really arbitrary uh, uh, measurements of size. So if you look down the literature, of course, Martin Fowler has an opinion. He has an opinion on everything. So also <laughs> him. And um, yeah, well. <laughs> and then some people started writing books. So this is Sam Newman's book. Quite a good book, actually. Um, and uh, there's even conferences. And they're sold out. Mm -hmm. There was only 200 seats, I think, in this one. But it was sold out, right? It's a, it's a pretty popular topic right now. Um, so if you look at the Gartner hype curve, which you're probably all familiar with, right? You know the Gartner hype curve? Yeah. It's like this. Um, we are now sort of blowing this thing up the ground. It's, it's the new hype, right? Uh, and everything, yeah, you should go there, and everybody should move into this microservice architectural stuff, and eventually we will go over the top. And uh, when people start trying it out, people started using it, and they all seem to think, oh, this is actually way too complex for us. And it will be for a lot of people. And the expectations go down until everybody says, oh, microservices suck. Let's move on to the next type. And some new hype will come along. I don't know what it is yet, but some new hype will come along. And people suddenly. But in the end, you will see that there, there is reason to do this. There are some advantages. And there is also some drawbacks, of course. But people will use this architecture stuff. So what is it about? Let me give you a short definition. <laughs> it's the shortest I could find. <laughs> this is Martin Fowler's definition. It's quite OK, right? Um, so I'll pick on some high points in there. So he says, well, it is an architectural style. Yep, no doubt about it. It consists of a suite of small services, um, and each running in their own process and communicating with lightweight mechanisms, often an HTTP-based resource API, built across business capabilities, and independently deployable. And also, it can use different data storage technologies. Now, that's all great, right? You all want this, right? You want to be able to use different databases? Or are you all stuck on DB2 or SQL Server or Oracle? Or I suppose you all went over to Mongo or Cassandra? <coughs> well, it's a different technology. And different technologies are there for different reasons, right? Um, relational databases do different stuff than no SQL databases in any type of brand whatsoever. So let me show you some of this stuff. Actually, what I think about this definition, it is usually, uh, it is usually uh, technology and infrastructure based, right? The, the fact that they are independently deployable makes it quite hard, actually. If you've ever tried this, try to, to, to deploy your, your individual components, maybe into a Docker instance or whatever you do, it's actually quite hard. And you have to figure out a whole lot of stuff to do this. So some of the benefits is, it's, for instance, it's scalability, right? So if you have this monolithical system, it's a very small monolithical system, by the way, um, and you want to scale it up, let's suppose it's still an executable on your desktop. The, uh, the only thing you can do, or it runs on the server for that matter, is scale up the whole application, right? And that is pretty expensive. Now, if you move into a microservice, you could say each of these parts is an individual deployable part. You could say, well, you know what, I'm going to run each of these parts on a different server. Or um, and you can just scale up those parts that you need more than the other parts. Those parts that have been used more often or more frequently or heavily, whatever, battered by some DDoS attack or whatever you have. And you can also deploy them individually. That makes them even more scalable. This is going into the direction where you can say, well, 
each of these blue boxes is maybe a Docker instance. It can work. It's not that easy, but it can work. And the same goes for this polyglot persistence, right? If you have a monolithical system, it's likely to have a very complicated database. Not the 142,000 tables in SAPR3, because you will never get rid of them. That's why SAP consultants are so expensive, by the way. But um, um, you, you could say, so one of my clients is running a database on 10 different systems that they've built. But it's one huge database. It has 600 tables in it. You might say, OK, that's fairly big or fairly small, depending on where you come from. But it's one database. So moving different parts in that database, there's a lot truckload of dependencies on, on the tables in the database. So if you break one of the associations between the tables and you put in something else, it will break all the code. That's a situation one of my clients now has. Now if you would be able to move that into different components, you might be able to say, you know what, for this particular thing, let's say the product, I'm going to use an Oracle database to put my products in. It's a relational database, seems to work quite well. Um, you might say, you know what, I'm putting my accounts in Active Directory, you might like it or not, but some people do that actually. And um, um, so it's it's now separated completely from the other storage. Um, or you might say, I'm going to put this stuff in MongoDB. One of my clients now totally moved from DBT to MongoDB because it is much easier to develop code against MongoDB than it is against the relational database. So I like it a lot. Um, so you could use different storage technologies for different components. And that's a good thing. So basically, if you look at what microservices is saying is, so stuff that is much more scalable, there's a decentralized governance because there's not an enterprise service bus in the middle that sort of arranges everything, um, and you have replaceable parts. It means that if I have my components independently, just some errors going in, I can replace it by a new version, for instance, or by a new version that uses a different technology, or even a different technology stack. There is no reason why all these components, in my, uh, my client's case, should be in Java. They could be made in Node.js, or they could be made in .NET, or whatever technology you're using, even COBOL. Uh, it's a bit tougher, but <coughs> you could probably do that. Um, and, and you can scale up, and, and that basically means you get a higher performance. Right? You can spin up 20 account services, for that matter, if you want to. It doesn't really make any difference. So it, it seems to be all good, right? It's easy to build because they're very small components. So if I look at the components in the landscape of my client, the biggest one, which actually calculates the rates for all the insurances that you can actually uh, request, has about um, 7,000 lines of code. The smaller ones have like between 500 and 200 lines of code. That is really small. And we can actually rebuild those in about a day or two. And that's good, right? You can just replace them by new versions or totally different technologies. That also makes them easy to test. Yes, it makes the individual parts easy to test. The integration part, to test that, where they all hook together, is much more difficult than with a monolithical application. And you have to realize that when you do that. We didn't, by the way, when we started out. But that's a year and a half ago. So, um, and deployment, is it easier? Well, it can be as soon as you set up all the machinery to do that. And setting up all that machinery is not that easy again. So it has a lot of benefits, and it also has a whole bunch of uh, drawbacks. Like people, so people asking, what is a microservice? Engine? How do we define that? And we sort of figured out ways to do that. Stuff that works for us doesn't mean it works for you, but I'll show you some of the stuff that we do with it. Um, and um, who owns the microservice is another one. Is any one of your teams actually responsible for for one or maybe two or three of these specific services? Does that also mean that if another team wants to change that service, that they're not allowed? And you have to think about how to do that. We actually say all the code belongs to everybody. It also means you have to have a lot of communication in place between the teams, saying, hey, you know what, I want to change this thing. And then the other team can say, yes, that's OK, let's do that, uh, as long as you test that. So uh, it's, it's more than just technology. Now, people have very different opinions about, about microservices. <coughs> Um, it started maybe off with, with, with again, Martin Fowler, who says, well, despite these positive experiences, however, we aren't arguing that we are certain, that's a quite complicated sentence, by the way, that we are certain that microservices are the future direct for software architectures. That means everybody should move into microservices architectures, right? And then Simon comes along, and he says, <laughs> Simon says, uh, if you can't build a monolith, what makes you think microservices are the answer? And he's right about that, actually. 
Well, I don't dare to say different, right? Because he's in the room. <laughs> anyway, so um, um, it basically means if you are unable to build your software anyway in a modular way, don't go off doing microservices. Am I inter interpreting that right? Or? That's right. Good. And then somebody else comes along and says, oh, different stuff. And then um, uh, Sam Newman comes along and he says, well, you know what? Um, he's the author of the book, right? And he says, like, um, um, he says, well, maybe um, Greenfield is not a good idea. If you start all over again, it uh, might not be a good idea to do market service at first because it's very complicated. But if you are doing Brownfield, let's say, pulling out pieces of an existing complicated system, then the market services architecture might be the thing for you. And then, of course, Martin Fallow, who has another opinion, than his own opinion, actually, and he says, as I hear stories about teams using a microservices architecture, I've noticed a common pattern. He says, almost all the successful microservice stories have started with a monolith that got too big and was broken up. I can't imagine that. And he also says, almost all the cases where I've heard of a system that was built as a microservice system from scratch, it has ended up in serious trouble. <laughs> So basically, the point of view seems to be, if you come from a monolithical space and you move into the market service of picking up piece by piece, it seems to work. If you're rebuilding everything, it doesn't. Now that's a tough situation, and I was in that situation because, well, I'll tell you about my clients a bit later on. And then uh, uh, Stefan Tilgoff comes on and he says, well, don't start with a monolith if your goal is microservices architecture. He basically says, if you want to go to a microservices architecture, so uh, uh, um, get the benefits out of that, you should not start building a monolith first and then move to microservices. You should build a microservice architecture right away. Now, that leaves me with a lot of questions, right? So you could say, is this actually a stairway to heaven or is it a highway to hell? So I've summed up my two favorite bands in the world, so there we are. <laughs> so I'm going to show you two of my clients. It's, it's I uh, sort of anonymized it a little bit, um, but the people from the companies will still be able to recognize themselves. Unfortunately, uh, they're not here. Um, they're in the Netherlands. So the first one is a major insurance company in the Netherlands. Um, this is not their building, by the way. This is just their mainframe. Um, they run a mainframe, uh, and this particular mainframe has an operating system on it that there's only two of them left in the Netherlands, <laughs> right? And uh, to get support, they have to phone immediately to IBM in the US, and there's like 10 old geezers there that know how to operate <laughs> this stuff. So they have to get rid of the mainframe, right? And it runs this code. Anybody of you recognize this? Looks great, right? Let's speak. Good to read. Um, and this is the way that they are looking, actually, on a daily basis into this code because they're pulling out stuff from it, because the mainframe has to be turned off. Actually, running the mainframe is more expensive than running the 25 people project to replace the mainframe. <laughs> so they want to turn it off as soon as possible. Basically also, because the developers writing the code, um, <laughs> well, they retire, right? They will retire in a few years' time. Uh, so they first started out outsourcing this stuff. It didn't really work. Um, so now they moved on to this space. It's Java, right? And, um, and it's, it, it, if you're a CEO of an insurance company, right? And you said, okay, these will be the guys to replace your mainframe. <laughs> Good stuff. So now the second case. I'll talk about these cases a bit more. So the second case is a very different situation. It's a product development company. They develop software to reinstall chemical factories, planning software, stuff like that. It started out uh, as a VBA application running on somebody's laptop. <coughs> Actually, quite, one quite like this. He still has the laptop. It's on his desk just to see where they come from, right? And it grew and it grew and it grew and they migrated it into VB. And then they migrated into VB.net. Um, and the application grew and grew and grew. Now they have 2.4 million lines of code in the application. The database with 600 tables. Um, I looked at the code a while ago and they have over 3,000 queries built up in code as strings. Now, if you've done that, you know what the trouble is with that. If you change the name of one single field in your database, you totally screwed, right? Their best friend is Control F. That's not a joke, by the way. It's really true. They actually go through the code, figuring out where these fields are. Now, that's not a decent architecture. The problem with it is that the developers didn't have a good sense of architecture. Basically, you could say they had no architecture. 
And you know what happens if you have no architecture? This stuff breaks down. And the trouble they're now in is that getting a change into the system takes about a year. A bit of a decent change. Well, that's quite long, right? So we only have one release per year, which makes it very hard for new clients who say, okay, yeah, I want to buy your software, but you should add this and this and this. And their planning is like, oh yeah, that will cost us three years. So they have to move, right? They have to get out of this situation. The problem is, I don't know if you've seen Finding Nemo. <laughs> you should have, right? So these fish spend the whole, the whole movie just trying to get out of this fish tank at this dentist office, right? You've seen it, right? And eventually they find a plot and they, set up, they, they, they get into these plastic balls. They have them put into these plastic bags because they see mail and then they flush through the toilet and they end up in the sea. And there they are in their plastic bags and they say, now what? That's the central piece of this movie for me, right? So they're, they're like, so, yes, we have to get out of this place, but how? And the thing is, if you just say, oh yeah, you have to do microservices architecture, you're not there yet. You have to learn a whole lot of stuff because it's a slightly or very different way of developing software. So, um, I, I, I got this quote from Aristotle, he just found me said, use this quote. And he said, like, for the things we have to learn, before we can do them, we learn by doing them. And this is probably the best strategy that I can give you to move into this field, is just start, start doing it. Try and figure out how to do that. So I'm gonna show you, in the remainder of this talk, what we try to learn from that, right? First of all, a bit about architecture is that you cannot define an architecture up front. Well, you know that, of course, because there's no situation where you can, but you should be allowing yourself to let your architecture grow, to let the frameworks you're using, the libraries you use, let that grow. And um, um, the only thing I could say is you, you should start off with some basic guiding principles, right, on your architecture. And the funny thing was, because I set them up for both of these clients I just mentioned, they were totally different. Because the insurance company, they sort of think in business processes. So everything to them is implementing a business process, whether you like it or not. So they had to have a business process first approach to that. Um, so we did that and we said, you know what, we're going to model out this behavior in, in use cases. But this is a fairly complicated use case diagram. Usually they don't get that complicated, but it has all the services coming out of these individual components and it's sort of put together in the user interface. So this is basically a Java portal. These are running on all different kinds of systems, et cetera, et cetera. So we sort of model that out. And also the architecture sort of reflects that. So if you look at the architecture, we said, you know what? We're going to put every single business process in a different application. Web applications, mobile applications, whatever they have. Um, and they all have the same architecture. They can have different technologies, but the architecture is the same, right? And we added a layer that actually implements the use cases. So the use cases in the model became the use cases in code. And the same goes for the components delivering the services. So these are actually our microservices components in the back end. They have a similar architecture. They also implement services and uh, uh, also as use cases so we can sort of model them together and, and see what all these uh, dependencies look like. So if I have um, a client side use case diagram and I add a service to it, I just drag the little oval into it and I see the connection. It makes it very visible. And to this client, that was really important. Now the other client, had a totally different view on the world. Um, they just needed a better architecture, or they needed an architecture, right? So we got off on a different path, and they have this long side, I'm not gonna read this out, but they said, yeah, yeah, we need to set up the architecture first, right? And they came from a bit from this, right? They have like 10 systems, um, all being in one big system. They have one big layer of controllers. Actually, the code is jumping around from there to there and there. They have UI code in the controllers, and uh, actually, code that should be the controllers that is in the data access layer, etc., etc. So it's a bit of a, let's say, it's a bit of a mess. And they have one big layer with loads of dependencies. Uh, and we sort of say, oh, the ideal world will be something like this. If you could split up this stuff, and if you could say all these backend components come out of it, you might say, yeah, well, this uh, delivers us a much better maintainable uh, piece of software. So they started off with a different strategy. They're saying, like, okay, you know what? We're going to pull out small parts of it and build them independently from the rest of the system and then pull the next part out until they've pulled out all the parts. That process will probably take them two years, I guess, because it's a tough process. Um, and the next thing is, in both cases, we had to think about design. Now, 
Both companies were not aware of something called domain driven design. I hope you are, by the way. Anybody, if you're not using this, then. <laughs> so that's, that's the thing, right? And you cannot say, oh, I'm just going to build this stuff. You have to think first. Now, there's a brilliant quote by Dave Thomas say, doing a big upfront design is dumb. You all know it, right? But doing no design is even dumber. You have to think about what you're doing, right? Now, one of the most important parts in this is, well, I, I love domain-driven design. I've been doing that for years and years. And one of the most important patterns in it, which I, when I first started reading about, I didn't get it quite right, um, is something called a bounded context. You know about bounded context? It's this, right? Uh, no, it's not. Um, it's, uh, so let's say you have a domain model or a database model or whatever that comprises everything, right? So there's stuff in your model that actually has different meanings in different parts of your, uh, of your database or of your, of your domain, right? So this product thing, for instance, plays a very different role when it belongs to ordering by clients or when it belongs to delivering stuff from vendors, right? So you could say you could probably break this thing up. Right? There is a part of product that belongs to clients and a part of product that belongs to vendors. And there you have it. So this is sort of the boundary between these two different parts. Now, if you separate out these different parts, you might as well say, if I find these bounded contexts in my domain, I could pull them out. And I could say, the components I have should actually be based around this particular bounded context, a small domain model that it sort of maintains and delivers services on it. And we did that in both cases. And in both cases, it sort of worked. It's not magic, right? It's just the way we do stuff. So we have very small domain models um, that actually sit in the components. This, but I'm sorry it's in Dutch. This is coming from a very, very Dutch company. Um, they only do things in Dutch. They write code in Dutch. That's horrible. But I've also seen Finnish code. That's even more horrible. <laughs> I can't read, I can't read Dutch. <coughs> and anyway, so these are very small domain models, and the components we have are built around the business capabilities, as Martin Fowler puts it. So doing, um, um, uh, doing microservices architecture, I, I think it's, microservices is actually a very, very good platform for doing domain-driven design. And that's one of the benefits we got out of it in both cases. Technically, and on, based on the infrastructure, both these clients went in different ways. But they both do now do domain-driven design. So that is a, a huge benefit of that. Um, also, we figured out ways to deal with these resources because one of my clients moved into doing RESTful APIs and the other one didn't. To them, it didn't add value. To the insurance company, it did add value because they're now calling these resource-based uh, uh, components from very different sources, from very different consumers, right? So we figured out a way to model that too, um, and we sort of created, yeah, we call it a resource model. It's basically a class diagram uh, with some additional stuff to it. And the good thing about it is we do this for each and every individual component, which means everybody in the teams, including the testers, the developers, the analysts, the product owner, um, knows how to, uh, how they're able to call this particular component. Um, also, um, these are the representations, so this is the stuff that comes back from your services. We actually generate code from that to be able to test the interface of our services. So it's, it's beneficial to us. I'm not saying you have to do this. It's worthwhile. Now, as you all know, if you have a relationship, good communication is hard. The same goes in software, right? Um, we sort of figured out that moving into RESTful APIs, uh, apart from it being very hip, uh, was also a good thing to do at this insurance company because we wanted to be able to call on these services from very different technologies. So we start doing that. But the thing is, REST seems pretty easy. And if you look at this definition, it probably is. But if you go into the details, it is not that easy. Just as an example, what if you want to use enumerations? So if you put them into JSON, they're sort of serialized into strings and you have to deserialize them, which means you have to have some sort of uh, uh, enumeration on the other side as well. So what are you going to do? Are you going to share those or not? Do you have two different enumerations running the risk that they will be different and uh, uh, they won't compile and the server will send back to 400? Or are you going to share them? And the same goes for stuff like value objects. 
Are you going to share those as well? And then people say, yeah, yeah, but if we share the value pins, we might as well share the domain objects too. Because then we could set up a shared contract. And a lot of people say, no, you cannot do that. Because if you do that, the code will be dependent on those contracts, on those physical pieces of code. So it's sort of in between there. So we're now sharing um, a, a lot of the enumerations and a bunch of the value objects, but we're not sharing the domain objects. Usually, domain objects in the boundary context of our components are much richer than the ones we use on the client. Those are usually a very small subset of what actually the service can deliver. That's something we do. I'm not saying you have to do this, but it, it works for us. Um, so there's Postal's law. It helps, right? Uh, uh, be conservative in what you send. Don't send too much. Doesn't add value. Don't do that because other people might, the users might get confused with the end users, but the, um, the software that is using that. And be liberal on what you accept. That means if you get in a piece of JSON and you have to deserialize that into objects, you make sure that fields that are in a JSON that you don't need are just ignored instead of all the stuff breaks down. So all these kinds of measurements you can take to, to be able to absorb all the stuff coming out of a, a component. Now the other client I had, to them, redoing the architecture was much more important than being able to use REST. And to be able to use it from mobile applications, but they just started out doing mobile applications. So they wanted to refactor all this code first, or actually sort of rewrite it into this new architecture piece by piece. So they said, we're not going to do this. Basically, if you don't do that, it also means that it's not very likely that you can deploy them independently. And to them, that didn't add enough value. So they got, so, so they didn't do that, right? So they just started writing code. They said, we're going to define the contracts just in an API with interfaces, um, and then there's a component implementing that, and it will be used by any application that actually needs that. So it sort of broke down the whole code base into smaller pieces. So we, start, we, we started doing that a while ago. Uh, um, but they have this contract-based uh, thing in the middle that sort of, uh, um, um, uh, sort of takes care of your dependencies, right? Now, after design, people say, oh, yeah, so what, what's, what's the testing? Now, testing a microservice, like an individual service, you can test that pretty easily, right? You can just say, OK, if I call on this, uh, uh, this URL, does it pass me back an account object? Oh, yes, it does. So it works. And if I send in the wrong URL, it will probably give a 400, maybe 500, depending on what you do. I can easily test that. So I can test these components from the outside. But the trouble is, we now have like 20 different applications, small applications. We have like 40 to 50 different small components, um, let's say on the server side, and they communicate with each other. And every time, we make a change to one of these components, we have to make sure that all the clients, all the consumers of this little component are still working, right? You have to start thinking about versioning stuff. Versioning your APIs, versioning your services. And it's less easy than we thought it would be. So the thing is, you have to test really rigorously. Testing becomes even more important than being in a monolithic architecture. So we sort of figured out what to do. Uh, unfortunately, part of my, my slide that goes off. But anyway, the idea is still the same. So basically, you have to test everything. So this is basically the life cycle that we have. And we sort of figured out that we needed to test everything, of course, automatically. So we've put in loads of unit tests. We've put in loads of integration tests running just after the build and stuff like that. Uh, uh, we do loads of testing on check-in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we do um, a sonar cube to test the quality of the code. Sure where it does, but it's sort of you can take some. Uh, uh, um, you, you can say, okay, I, I want to have this uh, uh, code coverage at least, and uh, I don't have cyclomatic complexity over 10 in a method, stuff like that. So you can add some quality assurance in there. Um, and the basic thing is, um, you should be able to test everything automatically. So it doesn't really matter how brilliant your testers are, and they usually are very brilliant. You have to test everything automatically. The only thing we don't test automatically is the, uh, is the product owner's acceptance. Um, everything moves through the pipeline until it gets onto the acceptance platform. Um, and, and that's where uh, there's a manual sort of acceptance test. Usually they just go through it and say, yeah, yeah, it looks okay. This works. I'm fine with it. And then it goes into production. But doing this, if you have tested it automatically, it means that you can move from 
uh, uh, one release per year into multiple releases for multiple components, maybe at the same time, just adding small pieces to it, right? So you can have very small changes in your architecture, very small changes in your components. It's a bit like Gmail, right? It's been in beta for like, I don't know, a decade? And it kept changing. If you look at how Gmail looks now and how it looks 10 years ago, the difference is quite big. But if you look at what it looks like now compared to last week, the changes are only very, very little. And that is a very good thing, because small changes are much easier to put through your pipeline than having very big changes. So the other client that has one release per year um, is in trouble for that now. And they are. So what about this in opinion program? What about pipelines, right? I should talk a little bit about pipelines. I'm not really sure how much I am in time. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Oh, great. I'll be able to pull all of these 99 slides. <laughs> That's good. So uh, anyway, so basically, we started off looking at these pipelines for, for putting the components through. So basically, we started out saying, you know what? We're going to give every little component and every little application we have their own pipeline to go through. So they go from development into test, into acceptance, into life uh, 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 independently. So we ended up with like, uh, uh, we set it up into stages. So there's development and it goes like that and then it goes to test and, um, and I roll the tests run again automatically and the integration test and stuff like that. And it slowly moves through the pipeline. Every component individual. So every change to component means we can run it through pipeline up to here actually and then there's a manual step that actually puts it into production. It sort of worked, but the trouble was we now have over 70 different components, right? So every, different, every component has its own pipeline. Defined. We started just to, we had to learn from that, right? And at one point in time, we figured out that, um, so this is one of our problems, I actually sort of, um, 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 sort of beautified the, the UI bit for this particular uh, plugin into Jenkins. I also added the picture of the CEO of the company here instead of that little guy with the mustache. Uh, um, that stuff you do when you get bored on a Friday afternoon. Right? <laughs> so we ended up with all these different pipelines, and it wasn't really healthy because they started sort of differentiating. So they, they all were different in the end. I said, okay, well, this is not the way to do this. And we sort of learned from that. And we started looking at all these engines like, like Team City and Bamboo, and we even looked at GoCD from ThoughtWorks, and of course we looked at Jenkins, and we now ended up with, uh, uh, we, we're just starting experimenting with the workflow uh, uh, plugin for Jenkins. Um, to be able to configure um, a actual deployment pipeline outside of the pipeline itself. So we put them in um, uh, um, configuration files that are in the build, right? So uh, actually the pipeline reads from the build. So we not only have three different pipelines, but we started to have that. So one for components, one for application, and one for the libraries that we sort of build up as well. Uh, and, and going from 70 different pipelines to three is a large improvement. Uh, by the way, we looked at GoCD because they have sort of templating for, uh, for building up pipelines. For us, it didn't really work. I can tell you the details, the nasty details about that, but um, I don't have time to do that. So, anyway, so um, the thing is, I'll just explain this. I'm just going to go through this. It looks a bit like this, but it doesn't, right? Because your components version and version. So, actually, your deployment landscape looks a bit like this. There's different versions of stuff communicating with other versions of other stuff. Um, that makes it highly complicated. So the integration test part becomes really, really important. But the benefit of this is that instead of saying, okay, I'm running a project, and once the project is done, I'm going into maintenance mode, you could say, I'm only going to build this minimal viable product and add small features to it, one by one, into the next uh, phase. So instead of that, you could say, everything's maintenance, right, from day one. That's usually what people call continuous delivery, right? So you, you, you just prove out small changes, but you have to get a version one out first. And that's not easy, right? Uh, and, and based on these tools, like looking at GoCD, Bamboo, Team City, and whatever you might have, uh, we figured out there is no single tool that actually does it all. Um, my one client uses Team City, the other one uses Jenkins, and Maven, and all this other stuff that I really don't really want to know about. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, and, and also it means that you have to change the culture in your company. Now, in the company I work for, the insurance company, the operations department is sort of like a kingdom on its own. Right? They rule the infrastructure. I've been battling with them for about half a year now to get local admin rights on my laptop. 
<laughs> and you laugh about it, but it's serious stuff. I still don't have it, right? I have a meeting next week when I get back in the Netherlands about local admin rights with these guys, right? But we have to pull them into the teams because they are very good at setting up all these pipelines. And uh, so we're now slowly pulling in guys from the, from the operations department to be able to configure the build pipelines, the sonar cube stuff, etc., etc. But it feels a bit strange still. And, uh, we'll get used to them eventually, but uh, they're different, right? So, okay, so final thoughts because I'm running out of time. The thing with microservices is it is extremely fun to do this stuff. It also is extremely hard to do this stuff. It is complicated technology. You might say, given the history we have, it becomes easier over time. Yes, it does, but over a period of 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so that means we're not there yet. So whether microservices is actually the architecture for you depends on a lot of stuff. I would say, um, if they're not for anyone, you should actually figure out if you will benefit from using a microservices architecture. Some of you will, some of you won't. But you can pick out, you can do some cherry picking, right? If you want to have multiple databases underneath your applications, this is probably a good thing for you. If you have stuff that you want to deploy independently and be able to change small pieces one at a time, that's also something for you. Um, independently deployable stuff, that's not for everybody, right? Um, you have to get all this infrastructure machinery out there. It doesn't always add the value you need. The one thing that I could say that it always adds, if you do it right, if you use the domain-driven design paradigm, if you talk about bounded contexts that are delivered by components, and deliver, as Martin Fowler's definition says, um, what is it, business capabilities, then you're on the right track. You can use it very good to do, to enforce modular design on your, uh, on your applications. One more thing I could say about this is, <coughs> I try to get my teams to live by. This is very hard stuff. It looks like an easy picture. It isn't. Well, the picture is easy, but achieving this is very, very hard. Most companies and most teams, and especially most clients, most product owners, will try to do this. They will put every feature they can think of into the product before they release it. And if you do a microservices architecture, it will actually help you to get to the second thing. Like, let's build this minimal viable product, which is probably a skateboard, and put it out first, and then decide what to do next. Maybe we can build the next skateboard, and maybe we can go from a skateboard to, I don't know what it's called, how is this, what's it called in English? Okay. A scooter, right. Yeah, I should have known that. So maybe we can say, okay, the skateboard we now have, we're gonna sort of extend it to a scooter, but you don't have to, you can also build the next skateboard. So making those decisions becomes really, really valuable, and the microservices architecture just sort of enforces this thinking. Um, and the last thing I would say is say, okay, you know what? Oh, it's not the last thing actually, but uh, uh, you have to allow your teams to learn. This is not something you can just implement. It will take you a couple of years to get this stuff right. So this insurance company with a team of 25 people, we were already on the way for over one and a half years. And we still haven't figured it out. Well. We're still learning, right? And we're still adding pieces to the landscape that we, that we are using and how to do this, etc., etc. So it's a bit like this model. Um, it's, it's, it's a hockey stick model. It takes a whole while to get the show on the road. But once you got it on the road, and you can add small changes to your components, add small changes to your applications, you will be there. And for me, one of the most important things is, and that is actually the last thing I'm going to say, is um, have fun, because this is fun technology, right? But I'm a developer, so I love writing code anyway. So, thank you for being here. I hope I am just in time. Um, I'm not sure. Did I? Oh, I am just in time. Right. Yeah. Well, she knows I, I never do that anyway. So, uh, anyway, so um, if you have any more questions, I'll be here for the next hour, hour and a half. I don't know. This is my website, my email address, my uh, Twitter tag. Thank you for listening to me and enjoy the keynote. Yeah.